Okay, so so far uh, we have seen uh, the important notion of completeness. Then we saw the notion of separability. Okay, these are the fundamental concepts, topological concepts, on which analysis revolves. The third concept that, that I would head towards is the notion of compactness. Okay. This is probably one of the most fundamental uh, concepts, but uh, before I get there, I will do some very simple things in real numbers and then slowly we will see what should be the generalization. Okay. So, we shall, we shall see that our eventual goal is to the notion of okay. so to start with uh, we will look at some simple properties of closed intervals This is what we will start with. But before that, what we we'll do is we'll give some one or two notions which will be necessary when we eventually generalize some of these things. Probably I have already mentioned this. So, so the first notion is the notion of the diameter of a set. So, suppose I have a metric space and then I take a subset of that metric space. So, first I take a subset of a metric space and then if I take any two points in the metric space give rise to the number the distance between x and y which is a real non greater than or equal to which is real and greater than or equal to zero. So, corresponding to every pair of points in the metric space we get a number in the set S yes, we get a number. Now, we look at all the numbers that we get as we vary x and y over the set S. Yes. You keep taking any pair of points calculate the distance that is a number. So, calculate all the pairs distances between all pairs of points. So, you get a subset this is a subset of r the real numbers because these are all real numbers the distance between two points is a real number. So, by varying all these pairs of points in that space I get a whole collection of real numbers these are non negative real numbers. So, when I have a set of real numbers they may be either bounded or not bounded. Okay. So, if this set of real numbers is bounded. What does that mean? That there is certain barrier beyond which they can all cross, cannot cross. Okay. There exists a k greater than or equal to 0 such that rho x y is less than or equal to k for every x y in S. Okay. So, that the distance between any two points cannot cross k, okay. that is then the set is called bounded. Okay. Then we say if this happens, then we say S yes, is a bounded set.
that is any two pairs of points are within a controllable distance, okay. they are not beyond, they are not going to go uh, beyond a certain control k. If it this set of numbers is not bounded, what does that mean? Any number there will be a pair of points whose distance will be more than that. Mean you can beat 1, you can beat 2, you can beat 3 and so on. So, in other words given any integer n, there will be a pair of points x n y n that that row x n y n will be greater than n. That means there will be a sequence of pairs that the distance go off to infinity. Okay. So, if this set of numbers is not bounded, then for every positive integer there exists x n and y n such that rho x n y n will be strictly greater than n, right. Otherwise, everything will be less than or equal to n and therefore, it will be bounded again. So, wherever you go, you can cross it. Whatever real number you give, there are two points in the set which are farther than n distance away. This means that is there exists x n y n in S such that rho x n y n tends to plus infinity, convert this plus infinity. Okay. Now, in this case, the case the set S is bounded, the set of real numbers is bounded, whenever you have a set of real numbers which is bounded, it will have upper bound, that least upper bound is called the diameter of the. Okay. So, when S is bounded, the least upper bound of rho x y such that x y belonging to S exists and is finite, it is really finite. This is called this least upper bound is called the diameter of the at S and is denoted by d S. So, what does that the sort of the optimal elastic limit to which the set stretches itself, the maximum points. In the case it is not bounded, the least upper bound will go to plus infinity actually, because no positive number can be an up bound. So, eventually for the least upper bound has to be taken as plus infinity. So, we say that the diameter is plus infinity. In case S is not bounded, we say diameter of the set S is plus infinity. This is comes from the notion of the uh, say a circle okay, and the largest distance between two points is the diameter that is the, that is how the word diameter. Simply means there should essentially be a sphere a ball with that radius which should come they encompass the set S, that is eventually what uh, the idea is. Okay. Let us look at one or two examples. Let us take the real numbers. The first example will always be the real numbers with the metric. Now, if you take S to be the closed interval or 
has to be one side open, other side closed or has to be fully open. In all these cases the diameter is 1, okay. in all these cases the diameter is 1 okay. and any infinite set, any infinite interval will have diameter infinity, okay. any finite set will have diameter the maximum distance between the pairs of a point. Now, let us look at, so all these sets are bounded sets therefore, the diameter is finite. In the, let us take L infinity, uh, just one more example, which they, this particular example will be looking at again and again. Uh, let us look at the L infinity, what does that mean? It is a set of all sequences which are bounded and the norm used is the supremum norm, the least upper bound norm. Okay. In this, look at the set S, which consists of all these U n's, where uh, let me put it as U super n. So, what is U super n? It is a sequence, okay. n equal to 1, 2, 3, etcetera. So, I am going to take number of elements in that and what is U n? U n is that sequence which has the nth component, except the nth component everything else is 0 and the nth component is 1. These are all in L infinity. So, I am considering a set S consisting of all such sequences and this is a subset of the L infinity space. What is that? Because you take any two points, the distance is 1. So, the maximum least upper one, everything is 1. So, the diameter of this set is 1, and therefore, this is a bounded set, and hence, this is a bounded set. So, we will keep this uh, simple notion of diameter with us. Okay. So, now I am ready to look at some properties of closed intervals and real line and to generate things we will need notion of diameter eventually. Okay. So, the first simple thing that I would do is start with I1, I2, In some finite number of closed intervals, finite number of bounded closed intervals. Okay, that means In is A n comma B n, the finite A n and B n are real numbers. So, I am going to look at a finite number of closed intervals n equal to 1, 2 up to capital N. So, I am interested in a certain property called intersection property. So, I am going to look at n equal to 1 to n I am take the intersection of all these intervals. So, I have finite number of intervals, I am going to take the intersection of all these intervals. Now, each one of the i n's is a closed set, because it is a closed interval and we know that the intersection of closed sets is a closed set. So, clearly that is what is meant by clearly i is a closed set. Now, we want to see how this I looks like. Now, 
Now let us look at the left hand points A1, A2, A capital N. There are only a finite number of them, so we can pick the maximum. Okay. So let us look at maximum. I can talk about maximum because there are only finite numbers. Let us look at all the maximum of the left hand points of these intervals and that maximum exists because we are dealing only with finite number. Now, when I take a finite number of fellows and say maximum, one of them is going to be the maximum. So, it will be equal to A j for some j, call it as i for some i 1 less than equal to i less than. So, the maximum has to be 1 of them. There are only a finite number of students in the class, the maximum score is 1 of somebody's score. Okay. Similarly, let us look at the minimum of all the right hand points and that also has to be 1 of them. It is not necessary that the ith interval has both the maximum and the minimum. It is likely that this is some b j. Okay. So, I am going to take all the, the min maximum of all the left hand points and look at the uh, minimum of all the right hand points. Okay. Now, I have two numbers A i and B j. So, whenever I have the law of trichotomy says either A i equal to B j or A i is less than B j or A i is greater than B j. Let us look at each one of these cases. So, case 1 is A i equal to the maximum of the left hand points is equal to the minimum of the right hand points. What is the intuitively we feel? That common point must be the intersection. Let us look at that. Okay. Let us call this as xi, that number be xi. The maximum of the right hand points and the minimum uh, maximum of the left hand points and the minimum of the right hand points, they are both equal, that equal value I am going to call it as xi. Okay. Now, you see xi equal to a i by definition and a i is greater than all the other a's, because a i is the maximum of all the, so this is greater than or equal to a n for every n equal to 1 to n. One. So, for every n. So, therefore, a n less than or equal to xi for every n. That is the first thing that we know. Okay. On the other hand, xi is also equal to b j and b j is the minimum of all the B, so B j is less than or equal to B n for every n. Therefore, A n is less than or equal to xi, less than or equal to B n for every n, which means this point xi lies in every one of the intervals i n, i n is A n, B n. So, this says xi belongs to i n for every n and therefore, xi belongs to the intersection n in equal to 1 to n, which I called as i. Okay. Belongs to that intersection. So, we know one point in the intersection, namely that common point which turns out to be the ma maximum of the left hand points and minimum of the right hand points. 
Now, not only that, further suppose i is less than a i. What does that tell? Certainly, it says that it does not belong to II because that II is between A and BI, and therefore, that cannot belong to II. If that does not belong to II, it cannot belong to the intersection because it has to belong to every to belong to the intersection. So that says. Anything I should not call xi, I will call it as x because xi is that fixed point. Suppose x is less than xi, which is equal to a i, that cannot go there. And what about if x is greater than or equal to xi? If x is greater than or equal to xi, that says x is greater than or equal to x is greater than xi, x is greater than b j because xi is b j. If x is greater than b j, it cannot belong to i j. So, that says x cannot belong to i j and therefore, x does not belong to the intersection. So, therefore, x does not belong to i. So, if x is less than xi, it will not belong. If x is greater than xi, it will not belong, but x is equal to xi belongs. So, for the intersection is precisely the single point xi. Okay. So, therefore, the conclusion that we have got is in case 1, what we have is intersection a i equal to b j equal to xi say that case the conclusion we have got is n equal to 1 to n i n is precisely the single point psi. Okay. So, now let us look at case 2. In which a i that is the maximum of the left hand points is smaller than the minimum of the right hand points. In that case, suppose psi is any point in this interval a i to b j is now an interval right a i is strictly less than b j consider that closed interval and consider any point in that interval. What does that say? The a i is less than or equal to xi right? and that says a n, a i is the maximum of all the left hand points. Therefore, a n is less than a i which is less than or equal to xi for every the largest left hand point itself is less than or equal to psi. So, any other left hand point must be less than or equal to psi. Also, psi is less than or equal to b j because i belongs to a i b j. So, psi is smaller than the smallest of all these and there xi must be smaller than all the p. So, that says xi is less than or equal to b n for every. So, it is greater than or equal to a n and less than or equal to b n. Therefore, a n less than or equal to psi less than or equal to b n for every n and that says xi belongs to i n for every n. That says xi belongs to the intersection n equal to 1 to n i n. 
this i belongs to i okay so therefore if you take any point in this interval that intersection any point in that interval is a part of that intersection now as before xi is less than ai previous argument it does not belong to ai and therefore it will not belong to intersection implies xi that belong to ii implies xi does not belong to intersection in implies xi does not belong to i similarly xi greater than or equal to ai xi greater than bj implies xi does not belong to ij which implies xi does not belong to intersection which does not so what have we got everything is in the in that interval is in i but anything outside is not in i and therefore the intersection is precisely that interval ai so any point in this interval is in i anything outside the left side or on the right side not belong to i and therefore the conclusion here is the intersection in i is precisely that closed interval a i b j okay now what is the case three a i is greater than b j case three now that you understood what's going on i'm going to leave it as an exercise a i greater than b j show that intersection n equal to 1 to n i n is empty nothing can belong okay see why same is similar arguments you can put together and get the result so what is the conclusion if we start with a finite number of closed intervals their intersection will be either a singleton or a closed interval or empty so that's what i am going to summarize summarize as property 1 so i property this is the simplest starting point for all this major cantor's intersection theorem etc etc okay so if f i1 i2 i n is a finite collection of bounded closed in r then the conclusion now i'll write intersection intersection n equal to 1 to n i n is either empty that was the last case or a single or a finite closed interval these are the three possibilities that can happen if you have a finite number of closed intervals in particular what will happen to the intervals are one inside the other that is i1 contains i2 contains i3 so what will be the intersection 
the smallest interval will be the you know if i n then in i n for n equal to 1 to n minus n minus 1 then intersection n equal to 1 to n i n is actually i sub n that is the smallest the smallest interval has the biggest left hand point and the smallest right hand point. So, that is a trivial case. Okay. So, now we are going to look at this in the infinite situation. Suppose I have a sequence of closed intervals and I will say one inside the other. So, let the sequence of bounded closed intervals. What we will show okay, such that i n plus 1 Again, they are shrinking intervals. Who would like to see what is inside? Now, let us see, for example, if you take a sequence of open intervals which are shrinking, suppose you take a sequence of open intervals, I will give you a sequence of open intervals, say 0. 1 that is the first one, the next one is 0 half, the next one is 0 1 third. So, i n is 0 1 over n, it is a sequence of shrinking open intervals. What is that intersection? Nothing, it is empty. Okay. So, if you take a sequence of open intervals which are shrinking, the intersection could be empty, but now what we want to assert is that if you take a sequence of closed intervals, they are shrinking, then the intersection cannot be empty. Okay. So, we will show intersection n equal to 1 to infinity i n is not empty. all the yeah when i say closed intervals i mean they are a and b n okay at least they could be at, at worst a single they could at worst be a single time. i say closed intervals so they will be of the form a b if they are bounded so they should be of the form a b where a may be equal to b it doesn't matter Okay, so, that is one of the properties which we, we will see uh, why does that happen? What will be the typical proof? If you now look at the same way before, how did we locate the intersection? We looked at the maximum of the left hand points and the minimum of the right hand points. Now, we look at the left hand points, they are all moving to the right, right. So, the, the right hand point, the left hand points form a non decreasing sequence okay. and they are bounded above, we will show that the, any right hand point is a bound for the left hand points. So, you have a non decreasing sequence which is bounded above and therefore, they will have a least upper bound. So, that maximum what we had before now will be replaced by least upper bound. Similarly, the minimum will be replaced by greatest lower bound. Now, therefore, we have a 
A which is the least upper bound, we have a B which is the greatest lower bound, case 1 A equal to B, A less than B, A greater than B. In A equal to B case, the intersection will be that common point. If A is less than B, the intersection will be that interval. If A is greater than B, the intersection will be empty. Okay. So, therefore, as before, we do the following. I n equal to a n b n, I n plus 1 contained in I n implies a n plus 1 is less, uh, a n is less than or equal to a n plus 1 and b n plus 1 is less than b n implies a n is non decreasing, b n is non increasing. Then, how is it? Let us look at this a 1 is here, b 1 is here, then if you look at a 2, it will be here and b 2 will be there. What do you see from this picture? That all the right hand points will be to the right of all the left hand points. So, any right hand point will be a upper bound for the left hand point. Similarly, vice versa, non increasing, and it is easy to see that. So, this is another dangerous word. Okay. It is easy to see that a n is less than or equal to b k for every n and k any left hand point is less than or equal to any right hand point. And therefore, least upper bound a n exists equal to a and the least upper bound will be smaller than any upper bound. So, will be less than or equal to b k for all k and this b k will be less than or equal to the greatest lower bound. Uh, let me put it. Here. So, A will be less than or equal to B k and similarly, the greatest lower bound of B n, B, B n exists equal to B and A will be less than or equal to B. Because A is one of the lower bounds for B k s and therefore, the greatest lower bound will be less than or equal to b. So, it is as uh, a is less than or equal to b. Uh, okay. So, therefore, that a greater than b case is out. That was the only case that would be just a empty thing that has been knocked out and that is what makes it non empty. Okay. So, 1 a equal to b then intersection n equal to 1 to infinity i n is equal to this point and if a is greater than b, a is less than b, then intersection n equal to 1 to infinity i n is equal to a b. And that part which gave the empty set in the previous case is ruled out, because a is less than or equal to b. So, therefore, the property 2 is that if you have this is let us call it property 2. If you have sequence of bounded closed intervals, then now we can write then intersection i n is non empty. In fact, it is a singleton or a closed interval and equal to singleton or a closed. In fact, you can interpret a singleton also as a close bounded interval a a. Okay. Okay. Now, we are going to look at a very special case of that. In all these cases, this a is the upper bound, right? a is the least upper bound of all the a n's. 
So, a n is less than or equal to a and a is less than or equal to b and b is the lower bound for the b n. So, a n is less than or equal to a less than or equal to b less than or equal to b n. So, from this we immediately see that b minus a is less than or equal to b n minus a n. What is that b n minus a n? That is the diameter of the i n. So, I will write it in the, so that says b minus a which is non negative because b is greater than a is less than or equal to diameter of i n. So, what happens if the not only they are shrinking, but they are shrinking such that the diameters go to 0? The length of the intervals is going down to 0. What will happen then? This will go to 0 and this will get sandwiched between 0 and 0, b minus a will become 0 or b equal to a. So, the intersection will be a single. Okay. So, if, if d i n tends to 0, then b equal to a and therefore, intersection i n Singleton. So, this is a property 2a you can call it. In 2a, in addition to shrinking, we want shrinking nicely that the diameters go down to 0. So, we will write it as property 2a. Okay. So, now property 2a, if in addition to hypothesis in 2, we also have d i n tends to 0, then intersection n equal to 1 to infinity by n is a single term. Okay. Which is not true if the closed the closeness is not there. If we are taken open intervals I may be shrinking, the remember the example I gave you 0, 1, half, 1 third. Here the diameters are going down to 0, they are shrinking, but the intersection is empty. So, the fact that closeness was there, this closed interval was a very seemed to play a very crucial role in that. So, if you have a sequence of closed intervals which are shrinking down to 0 size, then that place where they are all jamming up must be the intersection, it's common sense. Okay. But that common sense you should be careful that it should not apply to nonsense like the interval. Okay. We are going to push our luck further and further with this theorem and the final proper generalization is what is known as the Cantor's intersection property in a metric space. Okay. Now, we are going to look at S, uh, an important consequence. Of this result. So, let us again we are still uh, with R, we will see what are the implications, what works and what does not work when you are going to a general metric space a little later, but right now let us consolidate whatever we know or we are supposed to know in the real numbers. So, let us take a subset of R which is an infinite subset, as an infinite subset. bounded any bounded infinite subset of R. If you take a bounded infinite subset, any bounded set, what does that mean? I can capture it in an interval. There will be a closed interval 
unique she can enclose it okay because there is a case of that everything is less than or equal to uh, k okay. so there exists and a closed interval closed finite interval say i equal to alpha beta such that s is contained in alpha beta this is contained in so any any bounded set can be captured inside a closed finite interval Suppose this so, I know that S is infinite. Therefore, in this interval, there are infinite number of points of S. So, here is my I, which is alpha and beta, and I take the midpoint M of this interval. Now, there are two halves this half and this half. Since S has infinite number of points, one of the halves at least must have infinite number of points. If both the halves have only finite number of points of S, then the total number of points of S will become finite. So, therefore, since S is finite, as since S is infinite, one of the halves alpha m are beta must necessarily have this. call one such maybe both both of them may have infinite number of points what I am claiming is that at least one of them must have infinite number of points so, if both have pick any one of them, only one of them has infinite number of points, pick that fellow who has infinite number of points. Therefore, can pick a sub interval i1 contained in i such that i1 intersection s is infinite. There are infinite number of points in S. So, we can always pick a sub interval and such that the diameter of I1 is exactly half the diameter of I. By picking one of these halves, the diameter of the new interval I got is precisely half of the diameter of the previous interval. Now, what you do? Keep repeating that operation. Now, in this I1, take the midpoint, one of the halves will have to have <coughs> infinite number of points, repeat this process. To get <coughs> a sequence of closed intervals i 1 i n let us say such that one i n plus one is contained in i n because each time you are taking a sub interval of the previous fellow two the diameter of i n plus one if half the diameter of i n and i n intersection s is infinite for every every time you are going to pick up a sub interval number of points yes. so i am going to get a sequence of halved intervals in each of which we have infinite number of points of s yes. now what does the second condition tell us half of dn will be less than or equal to 1 square n minus 1 if you go on doing this, it will be less than 1 by 2 to the n di, the initial interval we started it. 
happens to it as n goes to infinity. This is fixed, 1 by 2 to the n will go to 0. So, this is the same thing as saying d i n tends to 0, because first time it is something, then half of it, half of it, half of it, half of it and so on. So, the diameter of this interval is going down to 0 and therefore, we have property 2 a, even without 3 now, we have we have a sequence of intervals, one contained in the other, the diameter goes to 0 and therefore, the intersection of all these fellows must be a single point. Therefore, the intersection of i n What can I say about that psi? Psi belongs to i n for every n, that is one for sure. That means, we have small an interval because the diameter is going down to 0. Okay. So, what could be the maximum distance between psi and a n? Okay. Let, let me put it. Here. So, now look at for any epsilon that interval. Okay. Here is psi, look at psi minus epsilon and look at psi plus epsilon. So, psi in i n for every n and i n s length can be made as small as possible. So, I can make this may be the i n I can make the length of the i n so small that they come inside this interval. Okay. So, there exists an n such that i n is contained in because the intervals are shrinking and xi is a part of it. So, they must include it. So, it must be a closed interval which contains xi and that length can be made so small that you do not go all the way up to xi minus epsilon, you do not go all the way up to xi plus epsilon, but the interval can be made as small as you like. What does that tell us? You take any interval about xi, the whole of i n lies in it, but i n has an infinite number of points of s. So, any neighbor root of xi has an infinite number of points of s that means xi must be a limit point of s because every neighborhood has an infinite number of points so xi must be a limit point so therefore therefore every b epsilon xi so b epsilon xi intersection is infinite for every epsilon positive Therefore, xi is the limit point for s. So, therefore, our conclusion is if we start with a bounded infinite set in the real line, we have shown that there must be a limit point, and this is the so called famous Bolzano Weierstrass theorem. It is a very big name called Bolzano Weierstrass theorem that is our conclusion. So, this is the Bolzano wire stress. There are too many S's, so we do not put an S. It is a tradition, yeah, that is a convention in English. When we too many S's, do not put the S also, leave it there. Bolzano wire stress theorem. This wire stress always gets me, there is one more E there. Okay. theorem it says that every bounded infinite set in R has a limit point.
yes yes yeah but i didn't say that the converse is false all i said was yeah definitely every open interval has a limit point every point in the open interval is a limit point okay so all it says is whenever you have an infinite set and if it is bounded not necessarily an interval as long as it is a bounded set and if it is infinite number of elements it is bound to have a limit point there is no question it cannot say i don't want to have limit point now i'll give you an example that this is false in general metric space this is false in a general metric space so look at caution this is not necessarily true i shouldn't say false this is not necessarily true in a general metric space for example let's look at x rho to be l infinity or our example which we saw last time a few minutes back when we are talking about the diameter of a set in that consider that same set we had before remember un n equal to 1 2 3 etc what is un it's a vector un has components 0 0 0 0 one as the nth component and 0 0 0 0 now at so on is s infinite yes because there are infinite number of such vectors you can go on pushing the component one to the right side so s is an infinite set is it a bounded set yes the diameter is in fact one so it's a bounded infinite set but it doesn't have a limit point because everybody is sitting at a distance of one from each other so they cannot cluster at any point at all okay this is a bounded infinite set this is a bounded infinite set and since rho infinity x y is equal to 1 for every x y in s x not equal to y we have that there cannot be any because if there was a limit point then you can draw a one third diameter one third radius circle around it disk around it at most one of the fellows can go and sit there infinite number of fellows cannot sit there at all so at most one fellow can sit and therefore it cannot be a limit point so no point can be a limit point so even though in the balzana weierstrass theorem says in r every bounded infinite set has a limit point it does not say that every bounded infinite set in any metric space has a limit point there the story is more subtle okay what is subtle we will see later okay. so these are only preparations to see those what how we should correct ourselves when we go to metric spaces okay any other question so somebody asked the question so we must be very careful bolzano weierstrass theorem for the real numbers say that every bounded infinite set on the real numbers has a limit point bolzano weierstrass theorem for a metric space does not say that every bounded infinite set in a metric space has a limit point in fact it, it cannot say because that result is false this one example will go on giving all counter things in in this sequence of arguments okay now we had property 1 which said that the intersection of a finite number of closed intervals 
is either empty or a singleton or a closed interval. Then we had property 2, which said that the intersection of a shrinking sequence of closed intervals must be a closed interval or a singleton. Then we had property 2a, which said if you have a shrinking sequence of closed intervals whose diameter goes to 0, then the intersection must be a single point. As a consequence of that, now we got the Bolzano Weierstrass theorem for real numbers. Now you are going to get a consequence of this Bolzano Weierstrass theorem, which is a generalization of property 2A. Now, what was property 2A? We had a sequence of closed intervals, one contained in the other, and the diameter going down to 0. Suppose I remove intervals there and say a sequence of closed sets which need not be intervals. So, now your question comes empty or non empty. So, suppose I have a sequence of non empty closed sets bounded whose diameter shrink down to 0 and one contained in the other, then still the intersection will be a single term. So, a more general version of 2A. Okay. So, now we are going to look at so a generalization, so a consequence of Balzano Weierstrass theorem. Okay. So, we are now going to see a consequence of BWT. BWT was got as a consequence of 2A. Now, a consequence of BWT is a generalization of 2A. A generalization of 2A. Okay. So, suppose Fn is a sequence of closed non empty bounded closed sets in R such that they are shrinking f n plus 1 is contained in f n for every n and 2 the diameter of f n tends to 0. We shall see then that intersection n equal to 1 to infinity f n equal to a single term. We will see both. This condition is not that float the intersection is non empty when the second condition comes the intersection is a single term. Okay. Previously also 2 said the intersection is an interval closed interval and in the if we had the additional condition the diameters go to 0 and the end points collapse to the same thing and we got a single term same way we will see the result also. Okay. This is what is known as uh, okay. this is a generalization of uh, 2A this is the basically the Cantor's intersection property for the reals. But again a word of caution, this need not be true in a general metric. Okay. For example, same fellows again will come into the picture. For example, consider L infinity same as before L infinity R. Now, we are going to construct a sequence. Now, let, first of all let us look at this set. Is this set closed? 
Remember a set is closed depend only if it contains all its limit points. Here there are no limit points, so there is nothing to contain. So therefore, this is already a closed set. Any set which does not contain any limit has, does not have any limit point is automatically closed. A closure is S itself. Now, therefore, this is closed. Is it bounded? Yes, because anybody, any two fellows, the diameter is 1. Okay. So, this is a bounded, call that as F1. Okay. Now, to get F2, remove the first fellow, keep the U2 onwards. Okay. Is it closed? Yes. Is it bounded? Yes. Is it contained in the previous one? Yes. To get F3, remove the first two fellows, etc., etc. Okay. What happens to the intersection? Nobody is there finally. Nobody can be there because if, if you take somebody, he is removed after some time, so he cannot be in the intersection. Okay. So, let F n be equal to uh, u k k greater than greater than equal to n. Okay. So, what is F 1? U 1 onwards, F 2 u 2 onwards, F 3 u 3 onwards and so on. Then F n bounded closed sets and I am sorry the diameter part I have not yet written yet. Uh, the F n plus 1 is uh, okay. This was an exam. I should have given it as an example. That sign. F n plus one is F n. The intersection F n is empty, and in this case D F n is all one. I have to give you another example where the D F n's don't go to go to zero. Okay. So this condition for non-empty now the, the single term that the diameter going down to zero was an important condition. This word of I have to modify this example. I'll hold it later. Okay for the time being uh, that word of caution will remain as it is. Okay. Now, I will just indicate a proof of it okay, that if you have a sequence of closed sets in the real line all are non-empty, all are bounded and they are shrink uh, and they are shrinking and their diameter is going down to 0, then the intersection must be 1, one single point. Okay. First of all, let us even hold the diameter going down to 0. What does that mean? I have F 1, I have F 2 and so on, one inside the other. These are all closed sets which are shrinking inside the other. Now, what I will do is since F 1 is bounded, all of them must be, of course, all of them are automatically bounded, they are shrinking. Okay. So, that is all are all are and f n contained in f 1 all are bounded. Okay, I do not have now. Okay, now, f n s are non empty that is part of the hypothesis. So, I can pick an element in f n it must be at least one element each one of these f n s must contain at least one point. Okay, so, therefore, I can choose can choose x n belonging f n. Okay. So, I have x 1 which is coming from f 1, x 2 which is coming from f 2 and so on and so forth. So, now consider this sequence. It may happen, what may happen? This is something. For example, I may take F1 to be a big interval, closed interval, might be, it may happen like this. F1 is a big interval, F2 
is a smaller interval inside that and F3 is just a point in the previous interval. The singleton is a closed set and then what should happen to F4? Since he should be contained in F3, he has to be the same point. That means I have to choose X3 and X4 to be the same point and also X5 and therefore also X, X6 and so on. So, it may happen that beyond a certain stage all the members of the sequence are the same, right? Or it is possible that there are an infinite number of terms which are different, okay? So, these are two possibilities that exist, okay? So, it may happen, it may happen. case 1 x equal to some x n naught for all for all n greater than or equal to right in that case how does the sequence look like x1 x2 x3 xk x k, x k, x k, x k, etcetera and so on and so forth. And therefore, the x k point of this sequence. And not only that, where does x k belong? x k belongs to f k, it also belongs to f k plus 1, it also belongs to f k plus and so on and so forth. So, x k belongs to f n for every n greater than or equal to k. So, what can we say? Therefore, x k is a limit point of what? F1, the limit point. Uh, so you okay. He says xk belongs to good Fn for every n. Why? Why? Because it is shrinking. Good. So uh, therefore, what can I say? Xk belongs to the intersection. And therefore, the intersection is not empty. Okay? So, in this case, therefore, intersection is not empty. I will come back to the thing unit. So, at least I can conclude that in this case, the intersection cannot be empty, there must be one point. The other case is the infinite number of there will be an infinite number, maybe I chose one here, the same thing for here a representative for this as well as this, but in the next stage I might have chosen a different representative. So, the case 2 is there exists a subsequence x 1, x n 2, x n 3, etcetera such that x n k belongs to f n k and of course, x 1 belongs to f 1 and all are different. Right? There must be at one at different stages picking different elements as we go along. So, there should be an infinite number of them. However, far you go in that sequence, there you can pick up one more new fellow this is different from the previous case. In the previous case that after some stage you cannot pick any new fellow. Here he says however far you go you will pick a newer fellow. So, you have got a subsequence which is now an infinite set. These, these elements form an infinite set. They are bounded because they are all lying in F 1. F 1 itself is bounded. It is a bounded infinite set. What does Bolzano and Westerson say? say, say it will have a limit point and that limit point will be in the intersection. Okay. 
So, I will just indicate the proof. Okay. So, then by B w t x n k has a limit point, this set x n k has a limit point psi and then claim. It is easy to see that psi belongs to the intersection n f n and therefore, f n is non empty, intersection f n non empty. So, far I have used the condition that the diameter goes to 0. All I have used is that the intersection will be, if we now take the additional previous time, you can show that what did you do the previous time? These two points, but the, if you have two limit points, they belong to f n and the diameter is less than any small number I can make, because the diameter is going down to 0 and same argument will carry over and show that if d f n goes to 0, then intersection f n is single. Okay. So, that is the uh, main theorem, which is now encompasses the closed intervals everything. Start from finite, get a picture, then go to infinite, then see shrinking, then shrink, shrinking down to 0, the diameters, then general you get a Balzano versus theorem out of it, and from that you get the general closed set. So, if in real numbers, the main theorem therefore is, these are all simply preliminaries, the first main theorem is this, this is the cap. f n closed on empty bound r f n plus 1 contained in f n for every n diameter of f n goes to 0 all this imply the intersection n f n is single okay. without this we have only the intersection is non empty. The diameter going down to 0 makes it a unique, otherwise it could be a non empty closed set. Okay. So, that is the famous Cantor's intersection property. Now, we saw at least in one or two examples, I will come back to this examples that this L infinity provided some crazy example where these things fail. For example, Bolzano versus theorem failed. We have the bounded infinite set namely that 0 0 1 0 1 0 0 0 0 1 etcetera. It was a bounded infinite set did not have a limit point. What went wrong? Whereas, this was true in the real case that a bounded infinite set had a limit point, but when I went to metric space I could find that a bounded infinite set did not have a limit point. So, what I am going to do is, I am going to look at boundedness from a different viewpoint. I am going to look at boundedness from a different viewpoint and in real case, these two viewpoints will be the same. Whether you view it this way or view it that way, both mean the same thing, but in a metric space that view point will be different from this view point and it is that view point which will take you further. Okay. So, what does that view point? I will just uh, start. suppose uh, let us look at the real line. Okay. Bound, I will uh, again go through this next time, boundedness in a different boundedness in R first. So, I have a set S in R, S bounded. Suppose, I go take and 
and I simply take any point x in the metric space, x, okay, r. Take any point x in r, okay, and then simply take that x minus epsilon x plus epsilon. So I want to write it in the metric space language itself. So take any epsilon, any x in r, and look at the ball, open ball of radius f epsilon about the point x, right. So, in this case it is just like an interval about the point x. There are two possibilities, one is now all of s goes and lies in this or some part of s lies outside that, okay. So, the two cases are s is contained in v epsilon x or there exists and x2 belonging to s so that x2 does not belong to v epsilon x right so in that case what i do is i look at v epsilon x2 also right another ball of radius epsilon about the new point x2 Right. What is the distance between x1 and x2? It is greater than or equal to epsilon, maybe sitting on the fence. So, at could at most at least uh, at worst it can be epsilon, but otherwise it will be more than epsilon. So, rho x1, I will write it in metric space language itself, rho x1 x2 is greater than or equal to epsilon. Now, you look at B epsilon 1 x x 1 call the first one as x 1 okay. union B epsilon 2 x B epsilon x 2 right. Now, the two balls that I have got the first fellow could not completely capture yes somebody was outside. Now, I took one fellow from outside constructed another ball around it. Now, and I am trying to see whether these two balls put together will capture yes. So, therefore, it may happen s is contained in b epsilon x 1 union b epsilon x 2 or there exists an x 3 which does not belong to that union, right. So, what will if you go on doing it, what will happen? It will either terminate at one stage saying that yes belongs to there are a finite number of balls their union contains it or this goes on and on and on that means you will get an infinite number of balls whose union whose centers who still may not exist exhaust yes more importantly yes will not be contained in a finite number of this epsilon balls okay. Now, what we will show is the latter is not possible, it has to terminate at after a finite number of steps okay. and this must happen for every epsilon, maybe for one epsilon it will terminate at the 100 stage, another epsilon it may terminate at the 1 million stage, but the fact of the matter is if the S is bounded subset of the real numbers, subset of the real numbers, then for every epsilon positive there will be this finite number of epsilon balls which will completely capture yes okay so this is another way of looking boundedness in the real line in the real line a set is bounded if and only if for every epsilon a finite number of epsilon balls capture the set yes but in the metric spaces these two ideas are different capturing them by finite number of epsilon balls and being bounded are different. For example, you take that L infinity that 0 1 1 0 1 0 0 0 1 0 okay? that is a bounded set, but you cannot capture it in a finite number of half radius balls because they are sitting at a distance of 1 away each. So, therefore, boundedness is different from capturing by 
finite number of epsilon balls in a general metric space. So, we will introduce a new notion called totally bounded sets if those set for those sets which are capturable by finite number of epsilon balls for every positive epsilon. In the real line boundedness is equivalent to total boundedness. In a general metric space boundedness is not equivalent to total boundedness and that one is the one that crucial which will carry over these properties. It is the total boundedness version of boundedness that carries over and brings up all the properties that we are looking for in the real line to a general metric space. Okay. So, next time I will start with this notion showing that on the real line a bounded set can always be captured by a finite number of epsilon balls for every epsilon and then give a definition of total boundedness see the example that these two are different concepts in a metric space and see how this total boundedness helps us to generalize the real number results. Sometimes you have to see the same thing with different glasses okay, and that allows you to move further. Okay. You are not changing anything in the real line. The real line results are the same. The only thing is I, I I put the boundedness in a different language and then took that language to carry over to the metric spaces. Okay. So, that is a very important notion in fixed spaces namely the notion of total boundedness that will be our next class. By the way uh, and I remembered because I said next class I will not take the class on Friday I may, I, I may not be in town. And next week, can we have the class on Thursday and Friday? Is there any problem? Okay. So, no class this Friday, but next week the class is on Thursday and Friday. Okay. This is for you also to remember. Huh? The problem is, I Friday I will be going out. I do not know whether I will return by Wednesday. I will be returning on Wednesday but uh, with the tremendous amount of uncertainties with our airlines and their timings i do not know even though i am scheduled to arrive by 11:30 i'll be here by 3:30 so i don't want you to keep waiting keep you waiting and then come here and waste your time and all so let us once and for all make sure that we meet on thursday and have the class on thursday and friday so next week class will be on thursday and friday and uh, friday this friday there will be no class L in maximum of the difference in the coordinates. When I put L in